Good morning. I want to take us on a journey into the future of transport, and actually we can't do that without looking at every part of the future. And of course, our focus today is intermodal transport, but it connects with everything else, how we move people, how we move product, and the digital society. In a way, it's shocking to me that we are even raising a question about rail. <laughs> Here's why. I, you know, of course, you know this, but I, I lecture on these things all over the world, and I would say most audiences I talk to are really shocked when I tell them that I can move a container from Rotterdam to China for the same cost as moving it 160 kilometers by road to get there. Extraordinary efficiency, astonishing scale that, we, that happens to us when we put a container on a ship. And as you know, <laughs> but most of my audiences do not, we also see astonishing efficiency when we put the same container on a railway line and we run that line on a nice long train, 740 meters long, uh, over two or three or four time zones. So nevertheless, the greatest risk for every industry is two words. It's institutional blindness. It's when too many people in infrastructure and supply chain management have been attending too many conferences with each other for a long time. In fact, we have the same in banking. When you have too many bankers, Having dinner with too many other bankers, you get a subprime crisis and a global problem. So, <clears throat> okay. So, uh, let me give you some examples from some other industries of institutional blindness, and then let's think about a different way uh, to look at our own future. Okay, so here goes. Um, all of you have been to nice restaurants. I wonder if you've had this experience. You're in a restaurant. Uh, you're uh, sitting at a table, you have a beautiful meal, but you cannot get the waiter's attention. Put your hands up, you're waiting for a plane, you want champagne, you want coffee, they will not look at you. Put up your hands if you have had this terrible experience, okay? Now, how much does it cost to train a waiter to use his eyes? Why is it that all the waiters in restaurants spend most of their time looking for insects on the floor? <laughs> It costs nothing to use your eyes. As a student, I worked in a restaurant, and I knew I could read maybe 200 people on 20 tables at the speed of light. Champagne, sir. Every time I nod, champagne, coffee, the bill, yes, dessert coming. It costs nothing to train someone to use their eyes. It takes 20 minutes for the waiter to learn the trick and to earn more money from their big tips. It takes one day for the restaurant to discover their profits have doubled. So why is it that we are all having trouble getting waiters to look at us? Institutional blindness in restaurants. Here's another one, in restaurants. Okay, so my wife and I, we are in Singapore. We're trying to order the meal, but even with my reading glasses on, it's so dark and the print is so small, I need a torch. <laughs> why is that? I'll tell you why. It's the same reason why I had a shower the other day in conditioner. I went to the shower. I, I went to the shower. I thought I'd selected shampoo and uh, covering myself in sticky white stuff. Put up your hands if you've had this problem too. <laughs> okay. Now, what is the problem here with the hotel? I tell you, they are institutionally blind. They do not understand that people like me need reading glasses to select shampoo or air conditioner or hair conditioner when the print is this small. In fact, there was one, one and I don't wear my glasses in the shower. <laughs> Institutional blindness. I'm saying, friends, you can be the world's greatest expert in hotel management. I, I lectured recently to 800 executives 800 hotel managers in Qatar of the largest hotel chains in the world, and almost every single one of them is making stupid mistakes like this because we are institutionally blind. <laughs> okay, so now, of course, there's no blindness in this room. <laughs> so will you allow me to go on a little journey 
as a human being, not as an expert in your industry, but just as a, as a traveler through life and just see what happens, okay? So I'm thinking about stuff, a, a disruptive events. These things keep my clients awake at night. <laughs> stuff happens. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, Brexit, Mr. Trump, God bless him. <laughs> Strategies for supply chain are regularly getting overtaken by events for my customers. And you said this to yourselves the other day, right? <laughs> That's why you saying, yes! <laughs> supply chains are changing faster than you can hold a meeting of your board. What that means is we have to be agile. Let me give you one example from Japan. Okay, so we had a 20-second crack in a nuclear reactor here. It was caused by a 20-second earthquake, 40 seconds of history, and they canceled nuclear power in Japan for 40 years. 40 seconds changed 40 years. Does it affect petrochemical industry or by rail? Yes, it does. Every, every sector of the energy industry connects with every sector of the price of raw materials for petrochemicals affects a, the kind of product that is moved by rail here in Europe. Because 40 years of energy policy changed here in Germany as well. Germany and Japan cancelled nuclear. But something else happened I'll come back to. You see, we require agility. If your world can change 40 years in 40 seconds, we need to think again about how we move stuff about. Now, there's one word that will drive the future, and it's not intermodal transport, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> okay? Intermodal transport, very important, but it's not the biggest driver of the future. The biggest single driver of the future is not innovation, it's not technology, it's not travel, it's not manufacturing, it's not energy, it's not politics, it's not, it's not engineering or science, it's what is this single word? This single word that will drive the future more than any other is actually emotion. Why is that? Let us go back, my friends, to the Japanese problem. When the Japanese earthquake happened, I said to you that Japan and Germany canceled nuclear for 40 years. They may change their mind, but it's a big decision. In the same year, China and the UK decided to go for the biggest building program they had ever done for nuclear power. What that tells us is that the future of nuclear power is not driven by an event like that. It's driven by an emotional reaction to an event. So the emotional reaction, let's say, to a Brexit decision or the election of Mr. Trump or, or Macron is much more important. That's why we talk about confidence in the markets. And this emotion issue is linked to another word, which is trust. And I want to suggest to you that if you are a bank, and you don't have trust, you have no bank, but actually if you are a logistics and supply chain company and there is no trust that you will deliver, you have no company either. So I would suggest to you that the primary thing that is being sold in logistics and supply chain is trust. It's an emotional thing. It's looking into someone's eye and believing that their team, even if there's a problem, they will always sort it for you. We see trust is a huge fundamental issue in the airline industry. Um, we see it in the logistics and supply chain, and we also see it online. Now, imagine last night uh, that uh, you checked into a hotel here in this wonderful city, and uh, you're, you're doing your usual. You're eating, uh, eating some food, doing FaceTime with the children, doing your email, uh, you're watching TV, and for some strange reason, you type Britney Spears' birth date into Google. I, I, I don't know why, but you did. <laughs> okay, into an iPad. Now you're sitting there, you're on FaceTime, doing your email, talking to the children, watching TV, um, eating food. How many seconds will you wait for Britney Spears' birth date to appear on her website? If the website is slow, how many seconds do you wait before you press the back button? Put your hands up if you press the back button in less than five seconds. So what we're understanding is here today in the Hupac 50th anniversary event, uh, after this wonderful celebration last night, 95% of you will press the back button in less than five seconds. Why? Because after two seconds, you're irritated. After three seconds, you think that everyone in the same corridor is streaming video at the same time. 
After four seconds, you think the web is broken in the zone, and after five, you have lost the will to live, and you terminate the whole business experience. I'll give you another example. My wife is trying to get money back from the electricity company. They owe us over 1,000 euros. So she phones them up, press one for accounts, press two for customer services. Put your hands up if you think that it's a social crime to make people press buttons like this. <laughs> and the people who do so should be put in prison for a very long time. <laughs> I'm just saying, we talked about digital just now. Please, let, I'm, I'm asking us to think more widely than just digital technology, to think about the emotion, how it touches us. I'm just saying that you have told me five seconds to wait for anything is like a million years. In your personal life, it's impossible to even imagine waiting for 20 seconds for anything. We are becoming very impatient. And this affects everything in retail, and it affects everything in the business-to-business -to -business relationship. Uh, let me ask you a question. If if imagine a, a terrible thing happened, and maybe someone in your family is very sick, someone needs to get a message to you in the next 30 seconds. How will they do it? Will they do it by phone, voicemail, email? How do you think they will do it? Put up your hands if you were primarily, if the person is really close to you, you will probably get the message by text rather than by voice call. Put your hands up. Now, it's very interesting. You see, maybe, uh, many of your customers who are 10 years younger, almost all of them are texting only. And in emerging markets, it's 100%. And they're all using one program, which is, of course, WhatsApp. So I have a business relationship in Sri Lanka, and this will horrify you. I have exchanged 3,600 WhatsApp messages with that business colleague. Why? Because the only people he deals with are family. If it's a trusted relationship, he wants to do it with family. It doesn't matter whether it's China, Malaysia, Singapore, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, I don't care where, Moscow, family deals, look into the eye, trust, relationship. We do business together, and we have a WhatsApp relationship. Why? Because who, who, who listens to the voicemail these days? Who opens the email? Only my, my distant colleagues open email. <laughs> but my friends, it's WhatsApp. It's a texting thing. I'm just saying our world is changing before our eyes, and the same, same thing is happening. You have told me, it's with tracking, you have told me that five seconds is a million years. Therefore, a five-second test is, can you locate your product where it is? Can you locate the container where it is? Can you watch the rail track where it is? Do you know the, where the FedEx parcel is? Yes, you do. Uh, do you know where the DHL one is? Yes, you do. You can locate the DHL package within half a meter on the surface of the earth. Logistics and supply chain management is connecting with emotion because people want to know because they worry where their stuff actually is. So we see, it's, this is a world of instant information. This is a world where people go into the store, they've been online, they want to find the right dress in the right size, in the right color before they go shopping. When they found the store, they walk into the store and they want to be guided to the right shelf and find it there because the system told them that the dress was there in the color, in the size, within half a meter. They are there. They want that information and they are getting it from retail and they want that information when they go to work and they are worried about the supply chain delivering some new clothes. Uh, why? Because it's all about location data and it's all about things like fast fashion. In the old days, in the retail sector for clothing, you could have maybe six months from design, first photographs, being out and in the store, and now it's 15 days. That means an extra two days and you're killed. <laughs> this is a, an accelerating process. It's putting very big pressure on supply chain management to do with the internet of things. And then, of course, you have another problem. So we've bought the product, but where shall it be delivered? We want it delivered at home, but who lives at home? <laughs> We're either at work or in the restaurant waiting for a waiter. <laughs> or trying to have a shower in a hotel with air conditioner. We want the product to follow us. We want to order the product, and we want the product to find us. And how long are you going to wait? You've told me five seconds is a million years. That's why many people don't bother to buy online. It's so slow. 
Even by the time you've done the payment, you have to wait till tomorrow, and then it will deliver to your home. They cannot, so they deliver a card. Then you say, ah, deliver to my neighbor, deliver to the petrol station, deliver to some other shop, click and collect. Yes, but actually better to click and follow. <laughs> Put it in the Uber, let the Uber van catch it and bring it to me, or maybe it's, if the traffic is great, then put it on an Uber bike, and the Uber bike bring it to me, and I get it 15 to 20 minutes after my order. I'm just saying, let's rethink what is happening about people's expectation of time. So supply chain tracking, I think, is going to be a very, very important thing. It's not necessary for most industries, but it's nice. People like to see, they like to know, they like to look on their mobile phone, and they can see, the package moving around. And of course, in industries like Airbus, which is one of my clients, this really, really matters. They are tracking 1.5 million different components into the A350 every hour, every day, within half a meter on the surface of the Earth. Now, of course, the real driver of logistics is demographics. One billion children alive today, all of whom will be using products Many, many of them using products represented right here in this room and using your methods of transport. One billion children, they are the drivers of the global economy. They are the reason for the truth about the last 30 years. Because it's the emerging markets that have driven growth. Over the last 30 years, despite the news headlines, the truth is that the global economy has grown very nicely every year apart from about six months. <laughs> at the height of the crisis. And at all points, it's been driven by growth in the emerging markets. Countries like Vietnam, this is 1985 through to 2011, on a zero axis, can you spot the global crisis? I can show you 50 graphs of different countries with lovely economic growth like this. Even a country like Uganda has been growing at about six or seven or eight percent per year without change for the last 10, 20, 25 years. And 85% of all humanity will be living in these emerging markets in 10 years' time. I don't know why we bother to sell anything in Europe anymore. Nobody lives here. All the growth markets are in emerging markets. Here we're fighting for tiny percentage increases of market share by killing other companies to win it. But look at this, one billion human beings will be on the move in the next 30 years. Why do I know that? Because it's been true over the last 30 years and the 20 years before that, that large numbers of people, as they become slightly wealthier, move. They move from mud huts in Nigeria or Uganda, where I've been recently, and they jump on lorries and trucks and then they send money home. And then they move from a poor city to a wealthy city, and then many of them will want to come to Europe. So we're talking about huge changes. They drive city growth. This is the reason why more money will be spent on infrastructure in the next 30 years than in the whole of human history. More rail, more road, more steelworks, more hospitals, more schools, more sewage works. Why? Because this the gigantic machine of urban growth needs feeding. And at the same time, we're seeing the number of vehicles soar in the world per 100 million. And anywhere we're seeing this stuff, it means we've got problems with road travel at the moment. And that road travel is getting worse. So we have travel speeds slowing down. And that's a big thing for rail. And even in countries like China, that doesn't show you these pockets of dark green where there's tremendous congestion. India the same, and where again rail has quite a role. Now, if we were to see the whole world have the same number of cars um, per, per head of population as America, we would see four times as many cars on the roads today uh, as there are today, and even more congestion because there's no way we're going to increase the length or the width of all the roads in the world by four times. It just is not going to happen. Now, while we have one billion children alive today, almost all of them in emerging markets, while we have 85% of humanity in 10 years' time in emerging markets, in Europe, in a country like Germany or Spain or Portugal or Italy, in many towns and cities and villages, we need four couples 
to produce a single great grandchild, one single baby, four couples, does that matter? You're not sure. <laughs> I think it might. In Italy, uh, there will be more than 90, more than a million people over 90 in 12 years' time, enough to change the result of every election. Does that matter? It might. So, you see, you either have to grow babies or you have to import them. It's a mathematical fact. If you only produce two, two, uh, th 1.3 children per couple, and you need to really to produce 2.4 per couple to keep your population the same, then your population does not grow. It goes smaller every year, a little smaller. And that's what's been happening across a lot of Europe, with, unless you have migration. So at the same time, we're seeing huge south-to-south -south trade. These are big trends, my friends, big trends. And we will see big migration into the European Union. Whether we want it or not, whether it is official or not, people will come. And by the way, Donald Trump cannot build a wall. <laughs> that works. Why is that? Well, all you have to do is buy a ticket to Disneyland. You go on a plane and you stay. <laughs> it's as simple as that. So walls don't work, my friends, and it's just the same in the European Union. So migration is here to stay, huge populations moving around, and as they do, trade patterns are changing. All kinds of new stimulation will come to the European economy through migration. South-to-south -south trade, we're seeing global trade is, is slowing down as a percentage of the growth. Why is that? Because every time global growth grows one unit, we used to double the number of containers. <laughs> Now we are only increasing the number of containers by about 1.4. So global trade is becoming much less important as a proportion, and it's being replaced by regional trade. And places like China are becoming too expensive, so we have, the good news is we have lots of manufacturing jobs already coming back to the European Union. So I have, I have multinational companies who are bringing their jobs back, where? To Poland, to Slovakia, to Slovenia, and after Brexit, to the UK because we've become an emerging market now. <laughs> Bankrupted by the folly of our own currency. Okay, so, but, but seriously, we're seeing regional manufacturing. These are really important trends for you. In the past, you bought, China produced brake pads and they were put into cars in Mexico. Life's too short. We can't manage supply chains this long. There are too many geopolitical risks and anyway, the cars will be bought in China, so why do we make them in Mexico? We make the brake pads in China, we build the car in Vietnam, half the price of China, and then we push it back across the border. So we're seeing regional clusters of trade, and, and this is going to affect the European Union and larger scale everywhere. So let's go back to retail, because retail is such a big driver of logistics. 50% of all retail spending in the EU is just 10 companies. In my country, 70% is in only seven companies. So these are because of huge consolidation, and we're seeing the same in manufacturing. So it's hard to imagine more than two airline manufacturers in the world, Boeing, Airbus, that's about it. And we've just killed off at the third mobile phone operating system. Windows has been destroyed. Now we just have iPhone and Android, that's all we can manage. Uh, we have seen uh, robotics grow, but actually robotics remains highly skilled and concentrated mainly in the auto industry with gigantic scale there. Uh, we're seeing auto driving, yes, but only five companies in, in the world have the software, the artificial intelligence to drive a vehicle without a human being in control. And when we think about what's happening in rail, we're seeing the same thing, huge scale of new technology at the fast end. We're seeing a gigantic boom in faster trains for people. And what I'm seeing is a tension between who wins the new track. We build the new track, but actually it's being dominated by people who pay a lot of money, who would otherwise fly business class from one city to another, and they're on the train, and the rail freight is somehow having to fit into the gaps, which is why we have the frustrations we were hearing earlier. We've upgraded the rail network, but we still have wonderful freight trains sitting in the side, waiting for the fast trains to come through, and waiting for night time to come, and then we bring the long train through the track at, at a quarter time. It's a big challenge.
And of course, this kind of scale, also very important. The, the gigantic scale, a, a, a huge integration, new systems and processes, massive investment in digital, in informatics, in location-based information. Um, the ability to, uh, to use everything. If you wanted one single way to increase the efficiency of freight hugely, it would be just one thing. You see, if you think of EasyJet or any other budget airline anywhere in the world, they would never run a plane. They would never run a plane with 30% uh, uh, full. Uh, they would go on selling until they fill the plane up. But every single lorry in the European Union this, to do this morning around here is running 30% empty. Well, let me explain. 30% of all the trucks that you see on the road here are completely empty. They don't even have a single plastic bottle of Coca-Cola inside them. They are just transporting air. I don't know any airline that would dare move 30% of all its planes completely empty, where the luggage hold is completely empty. There is not a single passenger up top, not a single crew member being moved from one city to another. It's just empty. Why? Because they're going back to collect another full load. Now, I'm certain that we can deal with this problem with, with digital integration, with an Uber-type solution, with web platforms, we should be filling this space it's also madness. We're producing the same stuff in two different cities. We're transporting it past each other on the same motorway to two different destinations. I know this for a fact. In my country, we make polyethylene granules and we export them to France. On the way, on Eurostar, polyethylene granules, which are identical, are exported from France to the UK. <laughs> What a crazy thing. It's the same with iPhones and iPads and, and bits and bytes and parts for electricity machines and fridges and TVs. This is madness. <laughs> so it just requires digitization. What an amazing opportunity for someone to build. If you want a secret to build a $1 billion business almost overnight, this is it. Deal with the empties and cancel the duplications. Wow. Now, when you put all this in the cloud, the Internet of Things, big data, and everything, then you get the most gigantic target for terrorist attack, for government attack, for, yes, hostile government attack. And we have just had a couple of little warnings about the kind of things which could hit us in the future. So you will expect to see a huge discussion about this, because as we put all this together, with our digital tools, we could find ourselves under attack where an entire infrastructure system is impossible to use for maybe even a week or something like that, or two weeks or three. Now, many of you are interested in green. You have to report on it to your companies. And here I've got lots of really good news and rail is full of this story. Okay, so the first thing that's interesting is this. 75% of all the growth of green energy last year was in China. Oh, I may be wrong. Maybe only 73%. Maybe it'll only 71% next year. I couldn't care less. The story is, this is China, China, China. Why? Because China needs to deliver a greening of their own country to stop a social revolution and to create the next generation of jobs and exports. They want to dominate green tech. And when you look at the astonishing growth of this, I have to say, burning diesel and petrol on roads is starting to look very last century. Uh, I spent some time recently with the R&D team of General Motors. I had a 400 people, this number in my audience, and they controlled $175 million of R&D budget, a huge amount going into only one thing, which is, of course, electric cars, electric lorries. Um, but let's go back to the petrol thing. Now, look, just look at the things we're already doing. By the way, you can't add all these savings together, but we were talking about 25% savings. If you've got an old truck, you can put new tires on it, nice tires, for 4.3% energy saving. You can streamline it for 12% energy saving. You can make it 1.5 meters longer for 5% energy saving. You can put a hybrid engine in for 30%. You can have 
You can have heat, power, and a combined air conditioning system, 5%. You can have shock absorbers, which every time they go over a bump, they generate electricity. That's nice, 4%. Or you just tell them to slow down. If they slow down their speed from 65 to 55 miles an hour, you get your 20% saving immediately. What this tells us is that we have a gigantic opportunity to transform energy in old-fashioned style diesel engines running in trucks. Now, we've only just started. I'm not talking about nanotech. That's another 5%. I'm not talking about uh, uh, entirely electric vehicles and so on. I'm not talking about vehicle trains. They save 30%. Or using technology to couple things together. Again, 30% or electric vehicles altogether. There are many experiments that have been done that suggest that within five years, we will certainly within 10, we, we will have a situation where maybe up to 60% of all local deliveries can be done using an electric vehicle. Tesla alone has one single factory that when it opens, will more than double the entire world's output of batteries, and they have only just begun. We are in the first two seconds of the first day of electric vehicles. Now, in addition to that, we have all kinds of government incentives, like here, for example. Um, I think I've got the, I'm not sure whether that should be a Swiss franc figure or a euro figure, but it's roughly the same. We're talking about a 100 euro tax for every 100 kilometers a lorry tries to drive through Switzerland. That's quite a lot. It's been very helpful in moving people into an intermodal transport regime. And we will see, I think, more countries do this. They have to because it's right for the environment, it's right for the roads, it's right for the economy, it provokes um, the building of good infrastructure, and I believe that rail will continue to be far more energy efficient over long distances than road, even with all the things we've just talked about. Because you have an energy, the, the, the air that you have to push out of the way when you have 720 trucks, uh, uh, meter trucks in one single train. The energy you have to use when you're just pushing something along on steel wheels on a steel track, it's such a beautiful way to move things around. It would be very hard for rubber wheels and potholes in the road and corners and turns and ups and downs in the hills and braking and accelerating to ever compete with rail on a longer distance. But we will need a lot of investment. <laughs> and of course, we're already seeing these rail journeys getting longer. Although I'm irritated that we still have to move the goods as soon as we get to Russia <laughs> across onto uh, a different gauge of railway. That's crazy. <laughs> Okay, now I just want to say one thing about C and then I'm finished. So C, I think, is fascinating. I started with the C story. If you look at the history of the world, you see that civilization has always been built around seaports, and it always will be, for the reasons we described. That it's cheaper to move the container from one seaport to another uh, at a fraction of the cost of anything else. That was so a thousand years ago. It was so in the times of the Romans. It was so in the times of the Greeks, and it will still be true in 2,000 years' time. This is the eternal significance of great ports. And countries without ports have consistently lost 40% of economic growth com compared to countries which have good ports. And if you have one week you save on shipping time, a country can boost its trade by between 7 and 26%. So digitization, really important. Dealing with custom and cross-border delays, really important. This alone generates, as you know, up to 10% of all our freight costs. In a digital world, we should be able to have a, like a biometric passport for every single package. It just goes through. And this explains why we've seen such huge investment in these super hubs, combining you know, the entire intermodal story, rail, sea, motor, everything, all in one site, with $226 million spent in Mexico on just one port recently. And this comes back then to the, to the HUPAC story of scale, ingenuity, innovation, and integration. And that is where the future is. It's a fully integrated, free to experience. It is easy, it's digitally smart, it's live data, it's highly efficient, well optimized, making use of all those empty containers going up and down, preventing product swaps 
or engaging in product swaps so many goods don't need to move as far as we think they do, making it very reliable, very agile to this rapidly changing world, and ultimately very low cost. So I wish you back every success. I look forward to coming back on the 100th anniversary to speak again. Thank you.